As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Reluctant Preppers provides educational awareness and commentary only. Opinions expressed do not constitute personalized financial advice. Viewers are encouraged to do their own research and seek qualified personal financial consultation before making investment decisions. Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. This is the first time we've had a physical gold dealer on our show. Nick Karpinski is the vice president of the Toledo Coin Exchange. It's one of the well-established uh, coin exchanges in the uh, Northwest Ohio region. It's been the owner, the original uh, founder, has been in the business since the 1960s. This particular business, Toledo Coin Exchange, has been since 1980 and in their current location since 86. Nick, thanks you for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. We had a lot of questions submitted by our viewers ahead of this in interview, and I really wanted to bring on a real live physical coin dealer because we've had a lot of viewers uh, asking questions about where can you purchase uh, gold and silver and platinum and so on. They certainly have been made aware by some of the advertisements I put on about uh, some online uh, uh, brokers of, of precious metals, but sometimes people uh, really want to get face-to-face -face and hands-on and have that that trust factor that goes with uh, being able to see what they're going to buy before they buy it, see who they're buying it from, and that privacy that can come with that. So we'll get into some of those questions, but thank you for, for coming on. And the other reason, and maybe you could kick us off with this, is how in the heck did you get involved with this, and what did you observe during some previous um, real um, sort of peak times in, in the uh, precious metals uh, over the last several decades when, when things were really going crazy. So could you first start us off with how you got involved in precious metals? I got involved uh, through the family. Uh, they, I graduated from college, needed a job, went to work at the coin shop with my grandfather and uh, really liked it. Uh, liked the idea of it, got into coins, got into precious metals. And uh, when we started getting busy in 2008, it just exploded. So um, it's been going pretty steady ever since, up and down, but a lot of people buying, a lot, of, a lot more people now getting into it than what we had even 10 years ago. I guess that's one of the things I wanted to make sure you could kind of talk us through is tell us what it looks like, what it looked like to you. There was certainly a big, uh, around the time of the uh, financial collapse, 2008, 2009 time period, there was a big rush of people getting interested in precious metals. And then another, that just kind of built and continued up to a peak in 2011. Can you tell us so that people who may be sitting on the sidelines now thinking about, well, maybe I'll keep an eye on things and if I get concerned because they, they want to keep uh, their, and we're not giving, asking for financial advice, but just tell us what you saw happen when people decided uh, late in that stage to try to get involved. What changed around your shop and around your business? Uh, our buying uh, exploded. It was exponential customer growth on our buying side. We buy a lot of scrap jewelry too. So that started off with the scrap jewelry just gold and silver jewelry that you know people don't wear anymore and we paid 92 and a half percent of the melt value which is really strong we sell it right to a smelter helped us do that so as those people brought that in they started talking to other people um, about their experience and they would start bringing things in and then they would start asking us about gold and silver bullion and coins if they had it they started bringing that in um, and then on the buy on our sell side that exploded too as it was going up people were anxious to hop in and uh, and, and get it on that ride and see what would happen. Um, it got even worse. Um, I think it hit about $22 an ounce for silver and gold was about eight fifty. dollars um, And then it just fell. It fell down to about seven, seven and a half dollars for silver. There was none to be found. I mean, we ran out. I couldn't get it from anybody. We were buying it from the public at $3 over spot to get it in because I could sell it for $11, $12 an ounce but I had none. I was buying forks and spoons my, myself for myself, just sterling silver forks and spoons just to have something. Um, everybody knew it was going to go back up. So that was, that was one of the biggest changes that I saw from our business just from 2004 to 2008. I mean, in 2004, we're buying coins and then we buy some gold and silver bullion, but 2008 happens and it exploded with metals. It was just, it was a fun ride. At that time when there was that peak in 2008, did were there lines forming? Was it easy? Could people just walk up for the first time and just walk right in your shop and buy what they wanted? You said that you had trouble finding supplies to sell, but you, the things that you did have, you sold 
for quite a bit over you know some some premium over over melt value but what about the uh the the nature of the clientele that you who were these people coming in what do they have to sell that kind of thing most of the clientele was i would call it middle class and lower were coming in um we didn't see a lot of upper class people coming in at that point um the recession hit i think the, the middle class and the lower class harder mm -hmm. Um, and so they would sell what they had to to make money and because it was it was so high Well, it seems so far away now 850 it seems like it's nothing now, but back then it was high um, They were getting a pretty good chunk of change to pay their bills or do whatever they needed to get by um, So that was that was one of the interesting parts Did of, you have you did yeah. you mentioned having a hard time getting supplies to sell getting uh, getting stock? Um, what about uh, were there crowds was there lines or was that not until was, later? Oh, no, there was lines. Uh, we were handing out numbers. We were handing out tickets. Um, it was typical to come to work and see about six or seven people lined up outside the door. Um, and then once we opened the doors, it, would just, it was like a floodgate. And it was exponential, too. And the, I remember the first day, it was just, oh, this is busy. And the next day, it's like, well, all the same people are here again that were here yesterday, but they've all brought friends. And the third day, it was like, okay, all those people are here now, and they've brought friends. It was, it was, it was just huge. And by the end of the week it was a lineup around the, co the corner of the building. So now instead of having five, four or five people lined up on a Tuesday, now here it is Friday and there's about 15 to 20 people lined up. Okay. So that was interesting. Most of them were selling scrap jewelry. Um, the buyers, we would let them come right in and if they weren't selling to us, we'd just take them right up to the register and they could buy right then and there and get out the door faster. There just wasn't a lot of buyers necessarily at that point, even, even when, as it was going up. We didn't see a lot of buyers necessarily. There was there was buyers, but not as many as I saw much later in like 2011. That so what, was even what was different in 2011? 2011 uh, clientele was different. Um, now it was now it was all the upper class people, middle and upper class. Um, we didn't see a lot of the low income people anymore. Um, they, they'd straggle in every now and then if they had found some gold or silver to sell. But now we're seeing collections of coins, and we're seeing you know 100 ounce bars of silver. We're seeing gold bullion we're seeing all this stuff that now these people have to sell because they're in financial trouble or have a debt or they want to turn profit and make money um that was even crazier than 2008 i'd say it was double it was easily double um the clientele and now we had an i would almost an equal number of buyers from us as sellers to us before it was four to one sellers to buyers now it was equal. It was a madhouse. <laughs> um, had no problems getting it, getting gold and silver to sell at that point um, because we had so many people selling it to us that we could turn it around and sell to the public pretty quickly. And if we had an extreme excess, we could sell it to different suppliers and they could distribute it amongst what their demand was. Um, but if we did have to order it, we had to be very careful um, about inventory because if we did have to order it, eventually – most of the suppliers were four to six weeks out, and then they were six to seven weeks out, and then they were seven to eight weeks out to deliver. And that was online, and that was all the suppliers that I know. There's one a huge one in Ohio, and there's another one in Michigan, and they were having trouble getting that stuff in. The smelters were bottlenecked, and they couldn't smelt it fast enough. It was exciting. It was different. And uh, during those volatile price action times, if you're waiting months to be able to, to fulfill the physical um, – a fulfillment of an order uh, what who carries the risk during that time about the price going up or down it depends it would, it would depend for us on who would want to buy and when if we had it available then the risk is pretty much ours because we're storing it and if the market goes up great it's in our favor if it goes down well we lost money for those that we had to order stuff in which was few but the people that came in the ordering online they were telling us, oh, yeah, I had to give, I had to pay right now, and I'm not going to get my stuff for four or five weeks. Well, the market can change drastically. I mean, it could change. It could go up, and, hey, you're in at a lower number. But if it dives down, which it eventually did, I mean, a lot of those people were probably ex pretty upset that they were in at 30 40 bucks when it went down to 20 bucks. We have a bunch of questions submitted by our viewers that we'd like to get you to weigh in on. And uh, reminding everybody that our purpose here is educational and not to give people individualized financial advice, but this is about your experience and what you see from the inside of the industry. Uh, Gary E. Warall asks, why do gold and silver American eagles sell at a much higher premium than other well-known bullion like maples, Krugerrands, Britannias, and Libertads, especially considering that some of these coins are purer? Do AGEs and ASEs really fetch higher bid prices? 
There's a couple of reasons for that, I feel. Uh, one is when it comes to reporting, uh, American Eagles, the gold and the silver Eagles, are not reportable. Um, you can you can come in and you can sell me 500 gold eagles right now, and there is absolutely no reporting on a 1099B form that you would have to do. You can if you want. The government will always take your money, but you're not required to. Same with silver eagles. You could come in and you can dump 2,000 silver eagles, and there's nothing. You do that with any other gold or silver, and there is if you meet some of those requirements. A thousand ounces of silver in a day, 25 ounces of gold in a day, 25 ounces of platinum in a day, and a thousand face value of 90% silver coin in a day. Hit any of those in one day doesn't matter what the price is that you're getting you get a 1099b form eagles are exempt um plus demand um people just like the eagles better um sure the maple leaves are pure um which is why america came out with the gold buffalo which is also a pure gold coin mm -hmm. um i'll tell you right now maple leaves i i don't i don't like to buy and sell gold maple leaves they're 24 karat they take on dings and scuffs very easy and when it comes time to sell them the customer scrutinizes those they're going to pay a premium they don't want them those coins to be dinged up or scuffed up so it's tough to sell them too um unless they're absolutely perfect i don't i don't really like dealing with them nothing against canada love canada love their product too but the 24 ounce 24 karat gold coins are very tough to sell so i i think that, that people like that that gold eagle and the silver eagle you also got double protection it's monetized it's a legal tender value so people figure if gold and silver fall through the floor hey i got a 50 dollar gold coin i got a one dollar silver eagle if if the dollar falls to the floor, hey, I got a one ounce silver coin, I got a one ounce gold coin. Either way, they're protected. Um, me personally, I, I like to buy straight bullion. Um, it keeps my, my break even point lower. Um, and I don't have to worry about selling a thousand ounces in a day myself. Um, I just, I don't have that much. <laughs> so I think that, I think people, the appeal is probably li liquidity. That's probably the biggest appeal. We have a viewer named Domo who asks, what is the average premium? A coin dealer will charge when selling a gold coin to them as you request cash that's different per dealer us right now we sell gold eagles at forty dollars over spot um, we sell silver eagles at, at two dollars over spot if they're this year's it's four dollars over spot because again I have to I have to pay more to get those 2019s in um, so it, every dealer is different I, I know that when we were price shopping other dealers in 2011 some were charging four and five dollars over spot for silver just bullion silver um some were charging 10. it just depended on who you'd call and when the market started to fall those premiums increased because those people were in at those higher numbers and they were not going to lose money so they would start charging 20 dollars over if they were in at 40 dollars and it dropped to 25 they were charging 20 dollars over spot for an eagle they probably still have them what about on the what about on the buyback side? the The question was, what what kind of a premium the dealer would charge when when you're trying to sell a, a coin to them for cash? So if a, if a customer comes in, and they want to sell you a gold eagle, for example. Uh, right now, we were buying gold eagles at ten dollars over spot. Then we we're buying them at spot. Now we're actually twenty dollars under spot. Um, most of the distributors that I know will only buy them at spot now. Um, I don't really know why. I haven't been able to quite catch why that is they've always had a premium and now in the last two or three months that premium has dropped off I don't know if people are just afraid to hold on to them or if their demand has diminished um, luckily I don't have to sell that to the, to the dealers right now or, or the distributors so I can sell them to the public um, but yeah it's it's a strange market for for gold right now so the gold Eagles we buy at $20 behind spot most other gold is 96% of the melt value because we sell at the melt value um, which ends up being less than twenty dollars or more than twenty dollars under melt, um, but yeah, it's it's strange the way it's working out right now. Mike Marshall asks: uh, Eventually, after a good run on gold and silver, I'll want to sell some of it for profits. Where can I get the best price? And more importantly, can the metal buyer write a check to someone else or to some bank versus having to write the check to my name? I.e., can the metal buyer write a check directly to my mortgage lender if I want to pay down my mortgage? Oh, great question. Yeah, uh, it depends on the business, I would think. Our policy is we'll write a check to whomever you want. I've written them to trusts, to estates. Um, I have written them to banks. I've written them to car loan places. It just depends on where you want the check written. We do have to tie it to somebody, though, so you do have to have an ID to sell to us. We do have to look at it and match it up with you, write down all the information on it. Um, we don't take social security numbers, though, just the, uh, the ID number. Um, we don't report anything unless it hits those numbers that we talked about earlier. Uh, for 1099b so 
yeah, I've written plenty of checks. I split up checks amongst family members, you know, give 500 to this person, 500 to this person. That's pretty easy to do. Um, I don't know how other businesses handle it, but it's, we do it all the time. Uh, silver Silo asks about the gold silver ratio on trading silver for gold when the ratio drops. Can I do a direct trade of silver for gold or gold for silver and pay the dealer's premium in cash to avoid losing metal in the transaction? Not usually. Um, normally, because we have a buy and a sell price, um, it doesn't usually work out in a straight trade. I, I think when I looked at it today, I think it was 83 to 1, 83 ounces of silver to 1 ounce of gold. Um, so if you brought me in, say, a gold eagle, you're not going to get 83 ounces of silver for it. Um, it just doesn't work that way because we have a buy and a sell. So I would buy the gold eagle for $20 behind spot. We'd sell the silver at $1.25 over spot. It's not going to quite equal 83 ounces. Um, occasionally, uh, if you sell enough, we'll, we'll take the markdown on the silver down a little bit more. So you're not getting hit on both ends. We might do 75 cents over spot or 50 cents over spot. So you're not taking as much of a loss on both ends. Most of the time I recommend me personally that you just you keep whatever metal that you have and save up and buy additional to add to it it just doesn't make much sense to me to trade metal for metal um but i mean some people have their own theories and that's fine um i would rather keep it myself and just pile up some money and then buy more silver buy more gold but yeah it doesn't usually work out to switch it like that this question is one that i think we're going to be seeing more of uh, as people uh, become more aware of different forms of precious metals that they can purchase. Mark W. says, will the, quote, numismatic element of a physical gold and silver actually be important or substantially beneficial as opposed to bullion and rounds when the currency fully collapses? Well, that's a future forecast question that may be a tough one to answer, but uh, uh, let's, let's start with that. First of all, when you saw, because you guys do, I believe, deal not only in bullion, but also in some coins that have some uh, collector's value as well. When these run-ups happened in 2008 and 2011, what did you see as far as the relative uh, numismatic premium or whatever on those collectible coins versus bullion coins? What happened back then? Oh, a lot of it disappeared. Um, $20 gold pieces are, are popular amongst the collectors. Um, and there's a 70-point scale for coins, one being poor and 70 being perfect. You get an old $20 gold piece, say from the 20s, and it would be graded a 63. So it's an uncirculated coin, it's a really nice grade. When we started to see that hike, those premiums disappeared. People just wanted to buy gold as cheap as they could get it, so they can get in right now and get in on that ground floor as it's going up. Premiums disappeared on all that stuff. We were selling those 63s for the same prices that we would sell 40s and 35s and 30s. It just worked out that way. It was coming in so fast that we would Buy it at 96% of the melt value, sell at the melt value, make the 4%. As the market was going up, it was great. And people were happy getting it for cheap. Um, so I would think that that would happen again. Uh, rare coins, that probably would not happen. If a coin was valued at $10,000, um, you know, even at $4,000 gold, it's going to have $3,500 worth of value in it. It's still probably going to be worth $10,000, maybe more, maybe less. It just depends on the market at the time. But that will still retain its value. But as that gap between numismatic value and metal value decreases, they go out the door. Uh, people just don't want to pay an extra, any extra cash for it. That's what we saw anyway. As speaking of reporting, you mentioned that earlier about this form 1099B. Could we? Could you slow down? You you went through very quickly, but p for people who are hearing this for the first time, if they're interested in uh, privacy of their transaction, that kind of thing. Just what help them be aware of what are the official regulations? You got probably your own store policy in addition to that, but but what are the official regulations about what kind of transactions must be reported to the government? A uh, 10 AMB would be issued if in a 24 hour period a person sells 25 ounces of gold, uh, 25 ounces of platinum, 1,000 ounces of pure silver or a thousand face value of 90% dimes, quarters, or halves. Um, you, you can't split it up between yourself and your wife. It's, it's per household, essentially. Um, silver and gold eagles are exempt. Um, and it's cumulative, too. So if you had 20 one-ounce gold maple leaves and five one-ounce gold Krugerrands, that's 25 ounces. That's enough to trigger that form. Um, again, they don't care if you're getting a dollar an ounce or you're getting $5,000 an ounce. That is completely inconsequential. It's all about how much of what are you selling, and it's all based on what you can use to um, redeem a contract on the market. You can call up your broker, and you can get a contract for 1,000 ounces of silver. If they call you up and say you have to deliver on this, you can deliver 100-ounce bars. 
they will not accept one ounce silver eagles. It's exempt. Um, when they made that law, silver and gold eagles didn't even exist. When they finalized the law, they existed, but they weren't put on the list. Probably on purpose, I think. But uh, yeah, so that's that's why that is. Um, people sometimes will take that 1099B form because they can claim it as a loss on capital gains. Um, but you got to have the receipts from when you bought the stuff. Uh, what about uh, cash transaction limits? Cash transactions, anytime an individual comes in and spends 10000 and a penny or more in a 24-hour period, it's reportable on 8300 form. It's not a secret. I, I normally pull people aside and say, hey, look, you know, this is going to be, if you do this, we can do this. You know, I have no problem doing this, but it is reported on 8300 form if you spend 10000 cash in a day. Now, you can spend a check. You can write me a personal check for a million dollars. If it doesn't bounce, we don't have a problem. They don't care about that. It's the cash. And there's other vehicles that are considered cash too, which is a whole nother arena. Um, but personal checks, wires, credit card transfers, um, bank checks over 10,000, none of those are considered as cash. A lot of other things are. So it makes it a little bit difficult for guys that want to hop in like right now and they have disposable cash um, to get in the metals market because if you do it all at once, you're gonna get you're gonna get that E three hundred form. EVZ and Oz says, have you noticed any increased difficulty obtaining gold and silver? If so, any particular forms? No difficulty right now. Um, we did see difficulty, like I was saying, back in 2011. If we needed to order it, our smelters and all our distributors were several weeks out. Um, it was it was all bottlenecked. The, the, even our smelter bottlenecked us at one point. So this is a place that, that takes the metal, the scrap metal, melts it down and strikes bars. They were getting so much in that they just they couldn't smelt it fast enough. Um, and they were the bottleneck for us. Um, we had to stop taking some of the scrap silver and gold at one point um, because it was just there. We were getting a longer and longer turnaround even on that. Um, so I imagine they couldn't strike bars fast enough for the other distributors to get them out to other places like us to sell it to the public. That hasn't happened recently, but we did see that in 2011. Uh, another question about payments and how you manage that rigor 4830 says want to know what i want to know is this if the gold price spikes as high as they're saying and i've heard quotes up to one hundred and seventy four thousand dollars per ounce so anyway that's a pretty big number but regardless if it's if if gold price spikes high who will be able to buy all this back from us it seems impossible it does uh, i think if we have that high of a number we're gonna have a lot of other problems in this world um and i can't imagine a place to be able to buy it um we were able to buy it when it hit nearly that $2,000 mark um, because we we're able to turn around so fast and keep the cash flow into the business. If that started to rise and rise fast, I don't think we'd be able to do it. Um, maybe on a limited basis until we built up more capital to be able to buy it at larger and larger numbers. But I mean, you would have to talk to a, a business that had just millions of dollars of capital to be able to do this stuff. I don't know too many of them around other than the banks and I'm not dealing with a bank. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what would happen in that, in that situation. Taking you back to that most crazy busy time that you had when there was the line wrapped around the building outside in 2011, was there a, a mix of buyers and sellers there? So, in fact, you could take in from one and sell to the other, that kind of thing? Yeah, uh, that's, that's what happened in 2011. Um, we were lucky in that respect. We had so many people coming in and selling us bullion that it was easy to turn it around. Um, even people that came in and sold us 100-ounce bars, uh, we were, it was easy for us to even turn those around. Distributors were looking for those because other their private buyers were looking for that stuff. So it wasn't uncommon for us to sell, you know, twenty, thirty thousand ounces of silver and over like a weekend to a distributor just to get rid of it because that much had come in in the last week or two. Um, even silver coin, we would sell thousands and thousands of face value of silver coin over a weekend to another dealer just because he could spread it around throughout the country. People wanted it. It was that was easy. Um, if we needed to order it, it became four weeks, five weeks, six weeks out. And then as we started to get customers coming in that were price shopping and looking online, they were telling us the same stories. Oh, they took my money, but it's five, six, seven weeks out now. Um, they just didn't have it to deliver. We were lucky that we were buying so much that we could just turn it around. So I guess that would be kind of like a last uh, avenue of questions if we could get into it is, People who may be sitting on the fence and thinking, mm, I think I might want to get involved, but I'd want to be sure and that kind of thing. 
what do you see as being the most difficult thing for people to accomplish if they wait too long? To wait too long? Uh, the most difficult thing for them might be inventory. I mean, if everybody hops in at the same time, then inventory is going to get depleted. Um, we were lucky in 2011 to have so many people selling to us. We didn't have that kind of luck in 2008 because they were selling more scrap jewelry than they were bullion just because of um, the lower income people coming in. That's what they had. Um, they just they didn't invest in gold and silver. So I guess it would depend in time what is actually happening in the world and who is affected. If, if the middle class, upper class is affected again, I don't foresee us having any problems just getting that stuff turned around. Um, if it's the other way around, if we have another recession like we did in 08, we might have problems getting that stuff in. Um, it's hard to say when to hop in. Um, but I remember when I first started, gold was gold was 275 and silver was three and a half dollars. I can't believe I didn't have $40 to buy a 10 ounce bar of silver at 27 years old. So I don't know. I would tell people if you can, you know, get yourself out of debt and then save some cash and maybe put into physical things. I think that's a good idea myself. Um, I personally do that. Um, I have the benefit of storing it at the shop. Um, I don't have to worry about storing it here, but uh, that would be my, my advice as far as that goes. What about um, you? People having concern about the we've talked about well, well recognized forms of uh, of precious metals. Um, what about testing for validity? There's been some concern raised, especially in recent years, about spoofing or uh, fake bars or that kind of thing. Uh, what what are you aware? What do you guys uh, do to test to make sure that the things that you're either taking in or selling are the real deal? And what other types of um, validation should people be aware of that, that they can do before either uh, buying or selling uh, know who you're buying from is my best advice um there's plenty of online avenues and auction sites make sure they have a return policy make sure they've sold a lot um, online people make sure they've done business for quite a while um, we happen to test a lot of the stuff we have an x-ray machine that we can use and we have caught a lot of fake gold and fake silver um, brand names with gold eagles maple leaves cougar ants caught all those fake um, silver eagles, Engelhard bars, uh, all that stuff has been faked. Um, and it, yeah, it, it comes through quite a bit. So yeah, to the novice, to, to just hop in, uh, know your know your seller, um, go in, introduce yourself, talk to them, um, ask them questions. If they're not open to your questions, try and find somebody else. We're getting so many people right now that are hopping in that are new at this. Um, we want them to be educated. We want them to ask those questions. So um, ask them how they know. You know, it shouldn't just be, oh, well, we've been doing it a long time, we know. I don't know how how exactly you know. Um, I, you can put you can put a thirty gram piece of silver in my hand, and I'm going to know it's underweight. We're just all that good at, at where I work, and if it's underweight, I'm going to go throw it on our scale. No, nope, it is underweight. I'll go and put it on the extra machine and see if it's plated. It's plated. So, or if it's not, it's the wrong size. They 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 can't get it one hundred percent right. It either weighs exactly the way it should, but the dimensions are off, or the dimensions are perfect and it doesn't weigh what it should. So, know your seller. That's the best advice I have there. When people are concerned about security uh, when they're arriving, if they're coming in to sell a significant amount of precious metals, any advice you have for them as they're bringing their physical stuff in to sell to you, how they can how ca they can maintain their safety and that sort of thing as best as possible? Yeah, we've, we've had customers call us and express that concern. And uh, we tell them, you know, call us when you get to our parking lot. We'll come outside and escort you in. Um, how many people do we need? Um, and we've had a couple of occasions where they asked for the police to be present and we've done that. We've got great, great terms on the, with the police. So they'll come over and, and they'll sit, sit a car in our parking lot just to have one there. Um, and we've got a gate as well in our place that we unlock. Um, there's cameras everywhere. We're in a good part of the city as well. So that all helps. Um, there have been instances where people have walked in, saw the gate and they turned around and walked out. Fine with me. Um, there are plenty of people that like the gate they, they like that idea of the security and once they're in hey you're in here you're safe with us um we've got other means of protection too um but for the most part we're all alert um again know your buyer call up and ask that question hey how do i you know when i get to your place what do i do is it safe you know do you lock the door can you come out and meet me they should be able to, to help you out with that i would hope or at least answer that question and on the flip side, after they've made a sale, for example, and, and the payment, the forms of payment that you guys do is typically check. Is that correct? Yep, all checks. So they're not going to have to worry about walking out there and being a sitting duck from <laughs> having a big <laughs> wad of cash bulging in their pocket. That's exactly why we do checks. Uh, we, we've spent half a million dollars in a week. We just don't want to keep that much cash in the place. Um, it's dangerous for us. It's dangerous for people walking out. 
Um, we don't want to advertise that. Um, so, yep, yep, everything's done by check. It's just safer that way. Um, I know I, I know people don't like uh, checks necessarily, but it's just the safest way to do everything. Nick, you've been in this business for some time. It sounds like your family's been in it for generations. Any questions that I haven't asked you that come to mind as far as perspectives and awarenesses that you've gained from being a physical precious metals dealer uh, in a, working in, in a neighborhood, in a community, and over the period of decades to see how things change as, um, as the economy changes and, and everything like that that I, that I haven't asked you? Uh, nothing I can think of necessarily. Um, again, the best advice I have for, for, for your fans are to, to know your seller. Um, ask them how long they've been in business. Um, ask them why they do what they do. Um, ask them if they'll tell you how they buy and they sell. I mean, if those aren't questions that they're willing to ask or, or to answer for you, then, you know, call me up. I'll answer that stuff for you or right over the phone. <laughs> um, or, you know, find somebody close to you that you can do business with. Um, ah, that's a good point. When you said close to you, is there any, because we've had this happen when you know, gun dealers have to worry about this. Do you have to find out the locale of where the people are coming from? Does it make any difference if they've crossed state lines to come to you or go to a different shop? Is there anything about that? Oh, not at all. Not at all. I mean, if, if they're buying, our buyers from us, if they if they pay with cash, I mean, they're as anonymous as, as you can be. I mean, okay. it's, a, it's a cash deal to us. We don't have to write anything down for that. Um, on the sell side, when, when they sell to us, yeah, we do have to copy down every bit of information on their ID. Um, it doesn't matter if they're from out of state or not. We can still issue a check to them. They may have trouble with their bank cat, you know, taking it back over state lines and cashing the check. And they, they may hold it an extra day, which I think some banks do because it's an out-of-state check. But other than that, there's really not any difficulties on our side with dealing with people from different states. We deal with them all the time. We've been speaking with Nick Karpinski. He's the vice president of the Toledo Coin Exchange in Northwest Ohio and a physical precious metals dealer. Nick, uh, this has been quite enlightening for us. You sent us a number of photos that you uh, had shared and we'll include those in the interview for our, for our viewers uh, through along this discussion. And just wanted to thank you for joining us this first time here on Reluctant Preppers. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Um, I'm glad to answer questions anytime. Hey, Reluctant Preppers, if you want to hear more of bonus footage from other guests we've had on, come on over right now to patreon.com slash reluctant preppers and access that bonus footage there. Take care. With surprising new concerns expressed about Dunnigan's changing hairstyle, one viewer even commented, that hair is dyed, fried, and laid to the side. But what you're not being told is Dunnigan's hair needs no dye thanks to the wonderful vitamin and mineral regimen that Melody recommends and is not laid to the side to cover any bald spot either since Dunnigan's full head of hair is exceptionally well attached. However, Dunnigan does use hair products only as a disaster prevention because he's at severe risk of catastrophic emergency situations. But although there may be some changes you don't like to hair, this is one kind of change you'll definitely want to have on hand if the situation gets hairy. Pure silver! And for a limited time, your first ounce of silver can be purchased at spot price with free shipping on orders over $99 by going to sdbullion.com slash rp and you'll be supporting reluctant preppers as well it's within your grasp to get your hands on the perfect change for hairy situations at sdbullion.com slash rp p.s donnegan was not harmed in the making of this video